Chris Stevenson here with uh, a guy that I've known for, I guess, yeesh, 87, oh. <laughs> I think, maybe earlier. I think maybe even earlier than 1987. So probably one of the people I've known the longest in Ottawa in both my professional and, and personal life. And the thing that's that's connected us and ultimately, I guess, I, I think made us friends. I don't know how you feel. Absolutely. But, um, is golf. And we've talked about our, our roots in the game. We, we both kind of came to golf in different ways. I grew up in Montreal, played at a, a public course that's no longer there anymore called called Grove Hill and was actually back in, in Montreal recently and had the chance to go and walk so down the, like the city street. There was two holes that were like on the other side of the road. You had to walk across the road to go play two holes. So it was a nine hole course. They sold that land at one point. So it went from a nine hole to a seven hole yeah. course. So we would go and like your round was seven holes. <laughs> you put your you put your ball Trying in the to get rack. A good score, CJ. Yes, finally. <laughs> you put your ball in the rack on yep. the first tee. Yeah, we had that and when the your, club too. And when your ball came out, that was when you teed off. There was no like getting tee time. Oh, we were the same. But Even at the hunt club. That's what I was gonna say. Like so, I you know Montreal on a public track and and uh, the you know your family's roots are firmly entrenched in in the Ottawa golf oh my scene. Gosh, like, what, yeah. your, what was your childhood like? at the hunt club where your dad peter was a long time oh, i was a back shop pro. rat i mean i was there all the time so we started out my dad uh, actually took lessons under stan kohler at the shoddy oh, yeah. air yeah. and then he got the job as the assistant at the hunt club it was his first job he was like 22 years old my mom was like 17 they had just been married that young both my brother and i uh you know our mom is still only 72 years old so so you know they we didn't we lived in the apartment buildings at parkwood hills and had zero money and i would ride around with my mom in her chevette and in her nova and we'd go see my dad at the shop you yeah. know and he'd work like 90 hour weeks like every day all day and it was kind of a wait till your father gets home kind of generational <laughs> thing yeah. that's what it was yeah. you know yeah but as soon as we were old enough to play and back then you couldn't play till you were like i think on the main course at the hunt club the main, which is now the south and the west, yeah. you had to be 14 years old to play the main course at the Hunt Club. And uh, But we started when we were like 10, 9, 10, at the course every day. And then I worked in the back shop. I did my dad's club repair yeah. uh, since age 15. My brother picked the range every night. He would get up before school. My brother, John, is a great player, was a great yeah. player. Yeah. And he, yeah. he won the Quebec Am, like, Quebec yeah. Junior, you know. And uh, he would do the range. He'd get up before school at 6 a.m. Our house was behind the third hole, and he'd hit golf balls down the third hole before school, then go off to school. And then at night he'd pick the range, and I'd do the club repairs and work at the back shop. Yeah. We'd get to the ra we'd get to the the, the shop after school, uh, take the OC Transpo bus from Glebe. I was in the first bilingual uh, program, Pierre yeah. Trudeau's bilingual program. And uh, I'd get there and there'd be 200 bags laid against the side of the shop. And you'd have to get your wet cloth and you started yeah. washing and putting away all night till 10 o'clock every night. Yeah. So I, I started it almost working as much as I was, you know, playing and yeah. then became a very good player. But that was just through living at the golf course, mm. which was an awesome way to spend a childhood. So, I mean, you had the success on the local amateur circuit and then both you and john get the chance and i'm i'm guessing back then there probably weren't a lot of guys that were getting an opportunity to go to nc2a on golf no you know how that happened this is a neat story you know how that happened so the hunt club at the time was a top 50 course in the country it's a little short now to still be yep. that but it's still a great place but yep. back then you know we had a pro-am every year that people flew in from everywhere to play and you had river mead royal ottawa and hunt club and uh, John was a really good player. He won the Quebec Junior, the yeah. Provincial Junior Championship. And Frank Clare, of Frank Clare Stadium, yeah. uh, was a member of the Hunt Club. And he went to Purdue and played football at Purdue. So that was the connection. He talked to my dad, or my dad talked to him. And he knew the people down at Purdue. And they took a flyer on my brother. And even though my brother had won the Quebec Junior, you know, a, a school in Indiana knew yeah. nothing about that. Right. There weren't any recruiters back then. Yeah. There were no agencies to represent good players. So Frank Clare, personally, of Frank Clare Stadium, and he was the GM, wasn't he, of the Co Rough Riders? Co coach. 
yeah, yeah. I mean, coach and, and really I nice think man. Later on, GM of of the Rough Riders. Yeah. Another huge deal about growing up at the Hunt Club was we were surrounded by people like that. That's what's so great about getting your kids in at a good golf course, yeah. right? Is they're surrounded by all these interesting yeah. community leaders and business people. Anyway, John went to Purdue, and as a freshman, he finished fourth in the Big Ten. And wow. uh, here I was a year and a half behind him, two seasons behind him, and I had been winning things and my stroke average was good and everything. And basically every coach in the Midwest said, if you're anything like your brother, come on down. And it was as simple as that. It really was. And I ended up at Illinois, yeah. ended up playing with Steve Stricker, who was Mike number Small. two in the world at one point. Mike Small, who's coach of... Uh, well, I think we're, when we're talking now, the, the PGA is just underway. I think Mike Small's playing in the PGA again. Yeah, he is. Mike Small has won the U.S. PGA of America Pro Championship. So the one for the club pros, three times national championship in America. I think he's won the Illinois State, uh, the Illinois Open like six times. He's Mm. an amazing guy. And when you go see him now at Illinois, he's got Illinois as one of the top five schools in the country. Coach at Illinois. Yeah, and I played with him. And behind his desk, he's got this awesome photo of he and Tiger Woods at Southern Hills where he was the low PGA member Mm -hmm. and Tiger won it. And so they're on the 18th green together with their two trophies in front of them. Uh, Mike and Tiger, yeah, Mike Small was on our team. Steve Stricker was on our team. Many other neat guys I've stayed in touch with. But that's how I ended up at Illinois is through, you know, the people at the Hunt Club, my brothers playing, and I've been in the game my whole life, yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, there wasn't going to be any doubt that somehow golf was going to be your vocation. No, no. Did you ever contemplate you know doing anything no, other than not being chance. involved in no, the game? No. And as a youngster, I think a player, you know, first. I yeah. mean, I became, I won the zone championship around here a bunch of times. And I think as a player, but I can even remember in, in university traveling around. We, we'd go to California for March break and play in Florida, Georgia, Texas. And I can remember looking at all the practice facilities and saying, this one's kind of crappy, you know. Or yeah. like we went to Stanford to hit balls. We played down... Uh, in Southern California and went to the Stanford and they had a really great practice area. And I can even remember back then looking at ideas yeah, yeah. and things they had and everything. So, uh, no, it was never an option not to be in the game. My dad was a club pro of the year in Canada. Yeah. He was a merchandiser of the year in Canada. My brother was a great player trying to, to play the world of golf, yeah. you know, and then here I came along graduating in 80, I think in 86 I graduated. Yeah. And, it was golf, golf, golf. Just what would I do in golf was yeah. the only question. Then a couple of streets over from yeah. here, the double the Well, double and deck. there you go again, right? So uh, Jake Dunlap, who my firstborn is named after, yeah. who was a GM of the Rough yeah. Riders, another yeah. connection, a great MC, great golfer, yeah. an Ottawa Hunt guy. Len Potashian, regional realty, yeah. uh, so much influence in Ottawa. Those guys got behind me as a 23-year-old kid who wanted to open a golf center. Yeah and uh gave me my first million dollars my first million you know my only million <laughs> a negative million but um and they bought the land over there we built the double deck holster but i knew Which cj is, Sen- is sensplex on yeah. the spot where yeah. the old double deck was yeah. if nortel you, if bought people the land. only know about this place but back back then oh yeah we, we built it it had 30 bays down below and yeah. 30 up top, yeah. right? At the time, I, I had this impression that over in Japan, right. they were building these big multiplexes yeah. and that that would be the thing to do. But I graduated at 23 because we had grade 13 back then. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, but my brother was already in Australia trying to play. And my parents still didn't have a lot of money. So he was scraping together nickels and dimes with members, you know, giving a few bucks. Yeah. Guys like Jim Tubman of Jim Tubman Motors and Jim Frisbee of Frisbee Tire yeah. and great people in the city and he had a few bucks in his pocket and he and eric kaufmanis yeah, from yeah. uh royal the ottawa. royal ottawa yeah. it was a great amateur yeah. they went to australia together and they were playing in asia and australia and, and south africa but I, I knew i wasn't better than my brother because he won the the quebec junior mm-hmm. and the quebec amateur and he was out there struggling away you know with wrinkled clothes in his trunk renting a lada and eating big macs you know that yeah, was yeah. his world back then yeah so i just thought you know what I think a, a neat golf center, one of these double deck things would be neat in this city and I could run a business like that. Right? I really admired my parents who, uh, I, though I love golf, I, 
I didn't love hitting balls 10 hours a right. day. I didn't yeah. love, yeah. I didn't have a singular attitude, like there's nothing else in the world I want to do except go to the range and pound balls all yeah. day. I, I was, uh, I don't know, I liked the business end of it. My dad was a great merchandise. You yeah. remember his shops? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And they were wicked. That was always good. a highlight from when you'd go and, and, and I'd get the chance to play at the hunt club, always stop in and, and see him and say hello to your, uh, say hello to your mom. But that was always a treat walking in there as a, as a golf geek like I am. Oh, yeah. To and walk they, in there and just like the presentation in there was just. Oh. The displays yeah. and everything yeah. and the flower arrangements. Yeah. My dad loved that too. You know, his, his world was presenting that, you know, and, yeah. and what a golf professional was and how he treated his membership, right? That yeah. was what it was. He was there 42 years. And it was always about that customer service, patronize your pro, yeah. and all of this stuff. Yeah, and that, that's actually that's a, a so many things have happened in so many different industries. I mean, my my well, business yeah, and media, absolutely. the way the way it's changed, but just the way it's changed for pros. I I think that the, the world of golf and the, the golf as a business is the poorer for what's happened to like the club pro. Like yeah, I don't want to overstate it. I, I'd, say tragic. I'd say yeah. tragic is the word. Because in that day, like, there's no question. My parents broke up. My mom was a, I call her a social genius. She knew everyone's name, yeah. uh, what their birthday was, what color. She would gift wrap birthday and Christmas presents for all the members for their wives. And when she went to buying shows, she'd buy the size and the color she knew they liked yeah. and fitted them. And she was really great, too. But at that time... The pro shop was the hub of the course. Yeah. Everyone went to the shop, and then you went up and had lunch or whatever, yeah. but that was it. And somewhere along the line, the golf business has lost that. And I think it's it's really bad for golf. Uh, you know, money became the driving force behind the board of directors' opinions. Yeah. They needed the general manager to, to operate the clubhouse and everything, so they saw value in that. And the, the greenskeeper, you know, you had to have good greens, so they saw yeah. value in that. But the pro, the golf pro, you know, some of the members thought, well, he rents out carts and gives us a pencil. Yeah. And, you know, if they weren't into taking lessons and game improvement, I think they thought that was a disposable item at right. the club to a certain degree. Yeah. So a lot of great pros like my dad got, you know, kind of shown the door yeah. in one way or another. And they said, let's bring in a younger guy and pay him half, which is exactly what's gone on in yeah. your business, yeah. right? No, I, and we're, we're no the poor for that in your business yeah. because you got a bunch of bloggers writing instead of these incredible remember eddie mckay but the yeah. journal what yeah. a writer he was yeah. right and you i mean you're yeah. a great writer yeah. and uh you're instead right, you get a bunch right of about, you're this right and a lot about a lot of things but particularly about what a good writer i am <laughs> well you are you're a great writer <laughs> bit of an ass but you're a good writer <laughs> anyway so i think i think um <laughs> touche <laughs> i think uh you know we've lost that in golf and it's really sad yeah. We've got a few still here in Ottawa. Paul Sherritt's awesome at Rivermead, you know. And, but it's a short list. Or at yeah. Rideau View, yeah. yeah. It's a short list. Yeah. Because uh, most clubs have seen, like, cutting that out of the, the club. And I think it's cutting the heart out of the club, yeah. you know. When you go to a place and there's great junior programs and women's nights and pro-ams and play with the pro. And, God, that adds so much to the yeah. pulse of the club, right? The You know, and that, that pro is, you know, I think particularly as a kid when you go to a course and like you said you're looking to take lessons you're looking to improve the pro is like the the uh the guy that the kids look up to right like he's the oh, guy who's giving the time. lessons he's, he's like their their knowledge center for well now, for there's the another game. problem though because in in hiring younger less qualified people the pro is no longer the best player at the club right. i mean back in the day yeah the pro was the player yeah. And it's great that the club champ was the club champ, but if he went out with the pro, the pro could probably take care of him, yeah. you know? Yep. So you admired that, and you looked up to it, and you wanted the little chipping secrets and the little bunker. You know, you you wanted to get all this information, but now when you've got a little clerk, you yeah. know, yep. standing behind the counter, it's happened all over the U.S. as well. Go yeah. to a resort, and, you know, you got a couple of young, a young girl or a young guy behind the counter just giving you your receipt, and it's lost its connection, right? Yeah. Which is really sad because... The game is so much more than just whacking the ball around, right? Well, and and it's it's lost some of that. You think, like, uh, I mean, I've taken lessons from you and and worked with you over the years, played golf with you over the years. We've traveled together. Um, 
I love golf because I still view it as like that lifelong journey that yeah, you take and like I Absolutely. still I still feel now like you know I, I feel like I'm hitting the ball than I, better than I ever have in my life yeah but every day you're thinking what's that other little thing that I'm gonna pick up on yeah, or you know, pick on that's just gonna help me move like a, a little bit farther forward each year I actually you know? find it sad that people don't get that you know like uh to a certain degree, I, I own a great golf center my wife and I have built. I really am proud of it. And But a lot of people just come and whack slice after slice and go right. home, yep. right? And yep. there's so much to there's so many layers to the game, right? And there's so much greatness to it. And the idea of taking a lesson, which I hate the term lesson because it, it, it sounds like it's almost homework. But right. the idea of getting some help or working with someone who can guide you a bit and then you try that out. And then you test it under pressure. I think it's just like that's the fun of the sport. Yeah, it's more just like direction. Like yeah. it's it's you know if you find a pro that you like working with. I mean, and that's that's the thing is you're like you're just looking for that little bit of you need to do just a little bit more of this. Yeah, most people have no idea what they're doing. Right, I, and I don't mean that dero in a derogatory way, but like I'll say, why do you slice? And they can't answer the right. question. And I'll say, do you know why that happened? And they don't. Right. And, and so what I mean by they don't know what they're doing is I mean that as soon as you see yourself on videotape yeah. and you kind of see where the club yeah. is and then you understand how that spin makes that happen. I had, I had, start that, changing I things, had right? that experience with you. Yeah. You think you're honestly, you think you're doing one thing and then you see it on video and you realize you're not doing anything close to that. And that, I, that's, I can't tell you how many times. That's kind of like that big connect, that connection, you know, that, that all of a sudden you have in your, it, the, the connection between what you're thinking and what you're doing. And then you can't wait and to go play like, golf again. Yeah. Because yeah. you're going to test it out, right? Yeah. And that's the game. The game is, uh, it's a lifetime game. The journey is the fun. Yeah. The, the buying new equipment to see if it changes ball flight or trajectory. Yeah. The, the working out a little bit or the, even when you eat your power bar on the front nine or back and whether that affects your scores and how you get through this five hour journey, you know, mm -hmm. walking through a course. So, you know, I think I, I wish the pro had a stronger role in the yeah. game again. I think that's a big miss by the game. And I think it's a big reason why golf has suffered. You know, um, everyone says the Tiger Woods effect. And there are different things. Bad economy, overdeveloped real estate. Yeah. But I think pulling the golf pro out of the, out of the equation yeah. has done a lot to hurt the game. The... Um both of us being having the opportunity to be exposed to the game when we were kids it's been uh, you know we were talking about how our, our lives have changed I moved here to Ottawa from Montreal to go to school and and uh, all through kind of your life journey for me I can say golf's been like one of the constants yeah. in my life and I've got the opportunity to share it with my kids now um, think of some of the things, not not to turn this around on you, but think of following Tiger at Oakmont, yeah. you know, and, and yeah. witnessing that, yeah. and then playing these great courses, being down at Augusta National. Yeah. What a part of our lives it is, and yeah. I'm the same, right? I go down and videotape their swings for teaching, and yeah. I know a bunch of the guys, you know. I obviously went to the school with Stricker, so, yeah. so I mean, that is so much a part of who you are, right? Golf is bigger than just something you do as a hobby, like. Yeah. Let's go do whatever that a, today. That was a, a great point you made earlier about um, just the people that you can get to meet, particularly as a kid oh at, my at the course. Yeah. You know, like there's you never know, you know that that uh, if you're working in the back shop or whatever, that guy whose uh, clubs are cleaning up or whatever. Maybe that's a guy who can help give you a lead on a job, or maybe it's a guy Absolutely. who gives you a lead on a scholarship. Well, look at my life. Scholarship, you know, scholarship a, and an entire university. career, right, with a few members. Um, how many kids have you, you got um, through your program now? Through your your uh, get the kids on the course uh, tournament, of course that you run every yeah. every May. I mean, how many kids have you managed to get on? Well, so let's go backwards now? a bit. First of all, uh, our friends at Club Link, because I I do some playing lessons and things at Canada and yeah. up at Eagle Creek, and I knew again through my dad, I knew the top guys at Club Link, the the head, the, the pros like Alan Ogilvy and Charles yeah, Lorimer, yeah. way back in the yeah. day. And uh, so they wanted a high-profile charity event in the west end of Ottawa. And they approached me because I had the radio show going, and they said, look, if you will do this with us and, and we'll have a big event, you know, and obviously they're a driving business, right? Sure. And, 
Uh, but there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, if you'll do this, I think at the time they had the Jason Spetz event in the east end of town. Yeah. They said, you pick the charity. And I am so blessed, CJ, in my life. I mean, uh, you know, my grandparents have now died of old age, but they lived well into their 90s. My parents are healthy. My brother's healthy. My kids are healthy. I don't have that, you know, lung disease or something. So I just, I said to the guys at Clublink, what I'd like to do is I'd like to buy memberships for kids to get into your courses because that was the thing in my life, what yeah. we just touched on, right? Yeah, yeah. I knew Jim Frisbee and I know all these in incredible, Dan Donnelly and Jim Tubman and all the business people in Ottawa. Yeah. And it shaped my communication skills, my self-confidence, everything. So I said, let's do that. That's how we started out. We've put, uh, we've been 10 years now. We just had our 10th anniversary of our fundraising tournament. Yeah. We've put, I think, about 650 kids onto good quality golf yeah. courses so they can pursue their dreams, but also have the opportunity to do the meeting and the growing yeah. and becoming community leaders yeah. later, right? Yeah. I think it's awesome. It's well, been a I great think, program. But then that's, I think that's the thing. And, and, you know, anybody who watches golf on TV has probably seen the ads for the first tee and that, and that's what you hear the kids talking about. It's, it's not so much learning about golf. It's learning about life and interacting with people and... Listen, at a country club, it, it has a reputation of being kind of a snobby, ritzy thing. It's really not that at all. It, it's a lot of really good people. Yeah. And I don't think there's anything wrong with rules and etiquette and respect and, you know, those things. And, I, you know, turning the hats around backwards and untucking your shirt and just doing whatever you want. Mm -hmm. That's okay. I, I have no yeah. problem with that. But at a golf, at a country club and in our junior golf initiative, you wear your hat properly. Yeah. You tuck your shirt in. You say hello to people, you shake their hands, taking your hat off after you've done yeah. your round of golf, yeah, you know, yeah. and I think that's a great part of having kids around golf, you know, so that's another whole element to it that I love, but it's been a, a, an incredible program. So we run the Kevin Haim Junior Golf Initiative, which we fund all kinds of programs and buy memberships, and our Kids to the Course Classic every year at Eagle Creek is our fundraiser, so yeah. we have all kinds of friends and sponsors. That's another thing. You know, all the people I've met through that. Yeah. Uh, guys like you, great guys like you and Dean Brown in the media side, mm -hmm. but incredible business people, you know, um, who own big companies and the yeah. top guns at Ping. And they're wonderful people to, to bring my kids around yeah. and to be around myself to learn, right? Yeah, I mean, you know, you think about the other sports that are near and dear to us in Canada. I mean, obviously, hockey's right there. But for me, just like that whole... The whole social aspect and everything yeah and, and the skills that you can acquire as a kid being at a golf course and being around a golf people course, skills it's not just not golf same, skills right it's not the same as, no. as playing hockey when on a hockey and you're playing against the other other kids or whatever it's just not the same like you know you have that five hours out there with somebody right yeah i don't want to focus on the negative too much but one of the sad things in the game is the removal of the club pro yeah. you know i think that's a biggie and, and that whole thing and the other sadness is I, I don't think people connect with golf properly and give it enough of a chance. And, you know, if pe grandpa will bring his grandson out here, give him a couple of tips, give him a club that's too heavy. Yeah. The kid doesn't have that much fun. It's like giving someone a, you know, a harp and saying, go play the harp. It's right. like, I don't know what I'm doing here, right? Well, and that's something people shouldn't lose sight of the fact. Golf's not easy. No. Golf, golf is not easy. And I think that's... I think that's part of the appeal for a lot of people and, and people like myself who have kind of embraced it as like a um, a lifelong journey. It reflects life. There's but hazards, it's, it's not, difficult. It's, yeah. not, it's not an easy game, but and, and that, that might turn some people off and there might be people there that'll try it a couple of times and, and, and feel um, embarrassed or whatever yeah, that with, happens their, with their sure. friends because oh i can't hit the ball that and they're playing and they're playing with somebody who's been playing golf their whole life or whatever and and the competitive part of them might say oh i can't can't compete so i'm not but you gotta get you gotta get past that believe it or and not realize that you can you can get better at it pretty quickly but you got to embrace it as that that's part of the fun of golf it's not just being on the first tee and teeing it up but yeah. it is like taking that time to work on your game two hours it's a, a massive week. part of our, not our marketing strategy i wouldn't call it that but it's a massive part of our awareness is to say to people look we're going to quietly go down here and i've watched thousands of people hit a ball i do not want you self-conscious like yeah. there's nothing you can do that surprises me or makes me gasp right and 
you know, once you get people to kind of be more comfortable and enjoy the process, but I talk to my team of pros all the time and say, look, you know, people have to enjoy their time here. It can't feel like you're going in for a root canal. Yeah. And then when they leave, they have to have some optimism and some hope, right? But it does take time. You know, a really neat story. Uh, uh, Daniel Alfredson came in one day and we were working with Daniel a little bit. And he said to me, golf's the hardest game I've ever played, mm. you know? And I said, no, it's not, Daniel. Like, you're an NHL superstar. Like, but imagine if all those mornings at the rink, the, the 6 a.m.ers, every day probably over in Sweden, all winter, if you committed that time to coaching right. and golf, you'd be a, a PGA Tour player. Yeah. But what we do is we sign our kids up for hockey, so they're all in. Here's my $600, and they get the year, and we buy them all the equipment, and they play for the year or two, and then they love hockey. But at golf, we're like, hey, can I borrow a seven iron and get a small bucket? And grandpa's going to give him a few yeah. tips, you yeah. know? Yeah. And they try it a couple of times, and the kids are a little frustrated. So I get frustrated at that. I think that, you know, if people would say, okay, let's try to do this. Let, let's book some time with a pro. Let's put them in a camp or two. Let's make sure we drive them to the course 10 or 15 times the first year and get it. I don't want to go over the hump. Yep. Yeah. Same as learning guitar. You know, people go to learn the guitar. My, my kids smoke on the water. You know, yeah, my yeah. kids did it. Everyone's kids do it. I signed them up for 26 Friday nights, six months of lessons, right? But people have a hard time booking a three-pack of lessons yeah, yeah. in golf. They don't think of it the same way, right? You just have to commit to it, and it'll give you back way more. Yeah. I mean, how many kids who play minor hockey are still playing at 50 and have met all kinds of business associates through it? For sure. You know, and here I sit. Right, and here you sit. So much of what you've done in in your world too, going to the British Open in yeah. Ireland, and all these great people you've met yeah. surround the game. Right, yeah. it's it's awesome. We got to get more people doing it. But and it's like, I mean, you can still play hockey as you get older, and you know you go out there and you poke around with your friends or whatever. But I think even in something like hockey. I'm, I'm never going to be a better hockey player than I was in my 20s, but yeah. I can be a better golfer yes. in my 60s than I was Well, the other thing about golf, 20s. you know, it, there's things about golf that are so different. Like, from a tour perspective, it's all fundraising. Millions are given back to charity. Yeah. And I know that, you know, the top players make a lot of money, but they also have a lot of charitable endeavors, and even the volunteers. You yeah. go, we have the CP coming up at the Hunt Club in a couple yeah. of weeks. They'll be... There'll be 1,600 business people, men and women, emptying garbage pails yeah. and volunteering, and then they'll make a giant donation to a charity, right? Yeah. So that's so cool about our sport from that perspective, yeah. right? And then the other thing that's neat about our sport is you can play the Hunt Club the day after the ladies and play the exact same golf course. You can go play. Uh, now, there's some closed courses, like yeah. Augusta's hard yeah. to get on. Yeah. But you can go play Pebble Beach right after the U.S. Open when right. Tiger's there and play the same course experience the same things yeah. have the same challenges as a matter of fact what's so neat about golf you can hit a better shot than tiger somewhere mm -hmm. if tiger fluffed a little pitch and yep. you're in the same spot you could hit a Make better a shot than yeah. him. you know yeah which is really cool it, it connects people to the sport right people don't just watch golf they participate in the exact same arenas right mm -hmm. that's neat what's the favorite place you've played Oh, I'm in love with Lynx Golf in Ireland now. Mm. I mean, uh, in college, we played the Olympic Club. Yeah. Where they played San the U.S. Francisco. Open a couple yeah. of times, which was awesome. I played, uh, played Beth Page Black with my team of pros and my son. That was a special experience. Great course. Great course in, in Long Island. Uh, and many others, you know, uh, all over North America. But I, I, I bring in groups of people to Ireland now. And uh, there's something just magical about mm. Being over there and playing. But again, it's it like it, it's how the uh, it's it's how the sport transcends just just being like you said, you know, an athletic endeavor, especially over there. It's the whole it's the whole experience. Yeah, all the right? towns are built around the courses, right? right? Yeah, yeah. We can't get that. The Montreal Forum is the only thing you think about when you, or maybe Maple Leaf Gardens, where the whole downtown's built up yeah, around that old yeah. building. Like you go to the town of La Hinch on the west coast of Ireland. And the nicest property is the golf club, and then the town is kind of sprung right. up around it. Yeah. And everybody caddies, and everybody drinks their Guinness and talks about yeah. their round at the club. It is literally, the town is named after the golf course, and that's the case in a lot of places. Yeah. Valley Bunyan is the same, yeah, you know? Yeah, go to uh, 
North Berwick in, in Scotland. And they've got this huge, like, 100-yard practice green, which is kind of like the, the town square. Like, so you'll go there in the evening, and the sea is right there. Here's this huge practice green. It's so and people cool. Are just, like, I've been there. People are just, like, stopping by with their putter and some they balls with their kids, and they're, they're putting on the green. And people are out walking their dogs, and people have strollers, and they're walking across the green with their strollers. But it's oh, like St. This Andrews, is, right? This is like the the the, the town center, the I gathering mean, point. People it's like don't this know that, green. but at St. Andrews, it's closed Sundays, and people yeah. throw the frisbee around and walk their dogs. They yeah. got their little bags to pick up their dog poop the week before the British Open's yeah. on. You know, it's yeah. an amazing thing about golf over there in culture. And I think, you know, they've embraced what we're missing a little bit. Now, now, I'm not going to be unrealistic and say that everybody in the world should play golf and that it should be the, you know, the nucleus of everything around it always. Mm. I mean, that's that's unrealistic. But when you look at how they think of the game over there, yeah. you know, golf in the kingdom and uh, the, the soulful aspect of it. We do a lot of our charity work because it gives back, right? Right. It makes you feel great yeah. and watching these kids grow and learn how to play and everything. So... I think if you if, if you get involved in the game and all the different elements of it, from learning it to appreciating the heritage of it, uh, the rules of it, just the whole culture of the game, once you get in there, it's like a hard nut to crack. But yeah. once you get in there, yeah. you really get it.